We want to extend a huge welcome to all of you who are joining us here at Columbine United Church virtually. Our uh, virtual membership is growing and growing, and part of it is because of your willingness and desire to plug in. Actually, many of you are here face-to-face. -face. When you miss us on a particular Sunday, you can always go to YouTube and watch us. But I want you to do more than just watch us on YouTube. I want you to click like. I want you to copy the URL and paste it on your Facebook page so we can keep on spreading the good message of Columbine United Church. But thank you for taking the time to join us. Our scripture passage this morning comes to us from the gospel according to Luke. All right, Mitch. Oh, it's always helpful if you push the right button on the top of the thing, not hold it backwards in your hands. Very good. <laughs> comes to us from the gospel according to Luke, the 23rd chapter, verses 39 through 46. This is the, the story of, of Jesus' death on the cross. We usually read this during Lent, but I chose this today because it's a very important passage to help us understand uh, the distinction between the body and the soul. This is a second sermon that I've been doing in this mini-series on what, what is the soul and how do we understand the soul. So listen for God's word as it comes to us today. One of the criminals hanging alongside cursed Jesus. Some Messiah you are. Save yourself. Save us. But the other one made him shut up. Have you no fear of God? You're getting the same as him. We deserve this, but not him. He did nothing to deserve this. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. He, Jesus, said, don't worry, I will. Today you will join me in paradise. By now it was noon. The whole earth became dark, the darkness lasting three hours, a total blackout. The temple curtain split right down the middle. Jesus called loudly, Father, I place my life in your hands. Then he breathed his last. And here the, the reading ends. May God bless these words as we seek to apply them to our lives. Soul food. I want to begin by asking you a question. How many of you ever watched somebody die? Yeah, many of you, many of you. You know, it, it's, a, it's a very powerful experience, isn't it? You know, for me, it's a, it's a, a week-in and week-out experience, a daily experience. I'm constantly working uh, with some family as they are working through the stages of dying. And over my 30-year 30 30 career, I have probably sat with somewhere between three and 400 different people who have, who have died, and I have helped them die, I have coached them in their dying. And the image that I have when I work with dying people is I want their death to be like the, uh, a landing of a huge, like 747. And I want that death to be just a gentle touchdown. I work with hospice nurses. I work with uh, nurses in intensive care. I work with families to try to coach everybody in the medication use and everything else. Because really, it's like a touch and go. I want to bring that body down so that there can be a liftoff. You know, and over the years of doing this, I, I, I have seen that there's a pattern. There's a very definite pattern that people go through. And after preaching this, the first service, uh, people over and over told me that, gosh, I've, I saw that, I saw that. You know, at some point in, um, in, in the dying process, uh, people who are dying see past you. They see past us. Uh, they enter into the, a different dimension. And they begin to see people, something around them. And they actually sometimes lift up in their bed and, and they reach their hand out to try to grab hold of whatever it is, whoever it is. I'll never one, uh, forget one time Foster Falkenstein, a, a member of our church who died about 10 years ago. I was sitting with him right before he passed away. And Foster kept on doing this, kind of reaching behind at the, beside the bed. I kept on saying, Foster, what's going on? What's going on? He said, I got to get my keys. I got to get my keys. I said, Foster, why do you need your keys? Well, because they're here. They're here. Well, who's here? They are. They're here to take me home. They see something. And then... I watch very closely as there are three breaths a minute, two breaths a minute, one breath a moment, the last breath. 
and I watch for that subtle change. I've actually had this experience that, uh, that you see on the screen behind you. Of one time somebody died and I literally saw their essence lift up out of them. The entire family was, was focused on the body and who he was lifted up and looked at me, looked around, and walked out of the hospital room. Right through the wall and disappeared. And this is a powerful thing for me. This is a powerful thing for me to share with you. In fact, I was talking with the uh, people after the first service. This is, a, this is a seminal sermon that I'm about to give you. If you want to understand some really important things about me and how I'm going to be teaching you and guiding you and leading you forward, you really need to listen today. Because this has helped me coalesce a lot of my beliefs about what I believe about the soul. And if we want to talk about some of the most important things we can understand, it is our soul and what is our soul. And I, I shared last week, uh, I talked with you about the entire history of the soul. I talked to you about the, the Hebrew understanding of the soul. What happened when Alexander the Great came down and conquered Palestine and brought with him Hellenism and Plato's concept of the body and the soul because the Hebrew people didn't have that understanding of a separation like this screen of the body and soul. But in the intertestamental time period, around 400, uh, the Pharisees adopted this concept of the separation of body and soul. And the Apostle Paul in the New Testament time of the first century was one of the, the first people who actually articulated it. If you need the details of that, you, I want you to go back, back on YouTube and watch last Sunday. But I, I got you right to the end uh, of telling you exactly what I believe, and then I, I said, oh, I ran out of time. You need to come back if you want to know what I believe. You need to come back next Sunday because I'm not stupid. <laughs> I'm all about building worship attendance and get you to come to church. And so today, last Sunday, I promise you, I'm going to share with you what I believe. But, and so I'm going to share with you what I believe. But, and listen, this is what I believe. This has taken me years to come to understand this. And I share this as an offering. Because ultimately, God doesn't care about you mimicking what I believe. God cares about you figuring it out for yourself. You have to wrestle with your own beliefs. And if what I'm going to share with you today is helpful, then, then let it be helpful. If what I'm going to share with you today is not helpful and is confusing and you disagree, then bless you, let disagree. The only thing that I ask is on both, whether you agree or disagree, that, you've, that you ask yourself, well, why do I disagree? And if I disagree, what then do I believe? After the last uh, Sunday sermon, someone came in to see me, and they said, well, you know, I really thought I understood the body and soul until, this, until Sunday's sermon, and then you really kind of screwed me up. I said, that's always my intention. Um, and, and the person said, you know, I was taught when I was younger that the body and soul is, is like an envelope and a letter. And I thought to myself, wow, I never heard this analogy before. And, and, and the person said, yes, you know, it, it's like, you know, there's the envelope, which is really nothing. It's just an envelope. And the significant thing is the letter that goes inside the envelope. That's what makes a letter so exciting, you know, when you get something in, in the mail. And that when you die, the, the letter comes out of the envelope. So the envelope is the body and the letter is the soul. You know, and it dawned on me in 50 years, this analogy is not going to work because they're going to go, what's an envelope? Now, if I confuse you today, if this sermon is confusing, then I want you to go back to this analogy, because this is a really good analogy, and actually, this is what I believed uh, really up to about, uh, I want to say like six months ago, but about six months ago, I, realized, I started saying, you know, gosh, there's really something different, then my, my understanding is going someplace different, and I wish I had, knew, had known this analogy. And so, see, what, what made it different for me is I started meditating on, on this saying from Jesus. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, a lot of the teachings of Jesus for me are like uh, a Zen Buddhist koan. You know what a koan is? A, a koan, a, a koan is, a, is a teaching that a Zen master will give to the student. 
And, and the student sometimes will take years to figure out, you know, what is the answer? Like a, a very typical koan is, what, what does the sound of one hand clapping make? You know, and that's just a simple one, and, 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 and the student has to think and think and think. Well, for me, the teachings of Jesus are like Zen koans. And I take a lot of these different phrases and I meditate on it. I think about it. And I say, what does this mean? What does this mean? Today, you will be with me in paradise. And what catches me, uh, catches my imagination is, in this phrase is, is the you and me in paradise. Notice that Jesus does not say, your soul will be with my soul in paradise. Jesus does not say, well, our body's going to die up here on the cross and kind of rot, uh, but then our souls are going to leave and we're going to go into heaven. That other guy, though, on my right, he's going to go to hell, but you and me, we're going to heaven. And what's fascinating for me is when Jesus says, it is you, the essence of this person, this thief on the cross, the good thief, which I really love, that term, the good thief. <laughs> you, the hit, who he is, is going to be with me, who Jesus is. And the you-ness and the meanness is not going to be lost. That the death that they're going to experience does not take that away that it actually goes into paradise. And it's not going to be in some great time when the bodies are down on the ground and, you know, when Jesus comes back and the trumpet blasts and all the dead will raise up, which is part of the, the confessions of the faith and the orthodoxy of the church, and there will be a resurrection of the body. No, he doesn't say that. He says, today, you, me, paradise. And then when I started meditating on it, started understanding it, what I began to realize is, oh, wow. To understand what Jesus is saying, you have to go back to the Hebraic notion of conception. And I, and I want to go back to with this because the Psalms, I think, do a very beautiful job. The psalmist says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. And the psalmist talk about is that even before, even before the, the sperm and the egg came together, even before you were a twinkle in your parents' eyes, the creator, the ultimate being, use any name that you want, God, Yahweh, that's not important. The ultimate being held you, held the luminescence of you. And you, you, there was really no sense of like you separate because you were, you were the image of God. You were part of God. You were part of this divinity. And, and you were held as you were being created, fearfully and wonderfully made. And Jeremiah says, before you, the God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Hebrew, that is, that sense of knowing is intimate knowing. And so God held the luminescence and planted inside us gifts and skills and abilities, proclivities, kind of an intentionality for our life. And that then, and that then when that was intended, that God flung us into the creation. And the egg and the sperm, they, they came together. And we were knit together in our mother's womb. And there was no separation of body and soul. There was just core essence. There was just divinity. There was just holiness. There was just sacredness. Nothing else. Holiness. Sacredness. And then you were born. And you became a child, and you became an adolescent, and you became a young adult, and then you became who you are right now, seated here in this sanctuary. And that holiness, that divinity, it has never left you. There is no separation of body and soul. How could there be? Because there wasn't in the beginning. How could this core essence of you ever go away? It hasn't. It is still there. Your core essence is not body and soul. It's soul. And so the key phrase, one of the key phrases that I want you to walk away from here today is this whole notion that you don't have a soul. 
You are a soul. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. And if you are a soul, you know what this means? It means that, la, I love this picture, la, you are a holy being. You are a holy being. The person beside you is a holy being. Your spouse, your children are holy beings. Your co-worker, your cranky boss, your, your cranky people that you have to work with, that neighbor who makes you insane is a holy being. Every single human being who has ever been created is a holy being. Even the most evil, the most heinous human being that you would say has ever walked the planet is a holy being. Call him Adolf Hitler, call him Saddam Hussein. They were holy beings. That's the tragedy of their lives. They were holy beings. They were created. They were held by the Creator. They were flung into the creation. The same holiness that is you is that is them. And unfortunately, they never work to actualize that holiness. Their actions kind of like muffled it. it. It choked it. It tried to remove it, but it can't remove it. And there is no entity that can remove that holiness because it is who you are. Now, going forward, from this moment forward, if you're going to walk with me, you're going to walk into some heresy, so walk with me, but do so at your own peril. Because this is where I really break with orthodoxy. See, I don't believe that we need to save souls. You know, Christianity is so, so enmeshed in saving souls. How? Why would you need to save a soul? Because that soul was, was placed by the ultimate being. It was never lost. It was always whole. It is the core essence. It was never separate. It's always been united with God. We create a separation. We think there's a separation. That's our own imagination. You are a holy being. You've always been a holy being. How could that would need to be saved? Now, there are lives that need to be saved. That's another sermon for another time. But the essence of who they are? No, 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 no. It, that's always been with God. It's also... Uh, why I, I, I disagree with my um, Eastern brothers and sisters, the, uh, the Buddhists and the Hindus. It's important to understand that the Buddhists really don't uh, understand, they don't believe in the soul as you and I might believe in the soul, but that's another conversation for another time. But Hindus actually kind of really resonate with us. Um, but uh, both of them believe that it takes lifetimes for the soul to mature to the point where it either enters into nirvana or goes into the presence of, of Brahman. And maybe it's taken me a lifetime of, of being, uh, you know, being recycled over and over again to kind of come to the point where I've been able to understand this because it's taken me a lifetime to figure this out. Because I know, I don't think you ever, you have to do all this stuff to, all these lifetimes to, um, to attain enlightenment because uh, enlightenment already is. You already are enlightened. You already are a divine being. The challenge is, is that you have to wake up to it. The challenge is that you have to understand it. The challenge is that you have to accept it. The challenge is that you have to live it. How would your life be different if you realized that you were a holy being living on this planet? How would you interact with people differently? Uh, this past week, I had the opportunity to sit with a holy being and talk with them. I was a person who has a terminal illness. And sitting with people who have a terminal illness is one of the most profound gifts to sit with these people. Because as they, their illness becomes more and more intense, they begin to let go of things that just don't matter. And they begin to realize, wow, this really doesn't matter anymore. And, and for this person I was sitting with, uh, we were sitting in their living room, and, and uh, they were surrounded by flowers. And for this person, 
they saw an intensity of color that I did not see. When we, we he, he took hold of my arm and we, he wanted to go out into his backyard, so I walked out in the backyard and he, he looked to the sky and he started crying and the sky was, there was a depth of blue that I could not see that he saw. When he walked back inside and he sat down, he started talking to me about, about parallel universes that he began to see. And he began to realize that life is so much more than just three dimensions. And, and he began to realize multiple dimensions. And he asked me, do you believe this? Is, is it okay? Am I weird? I said, no. I know you, no, you're not weird. Teach me. Teach me. What are you seeing? What do you experience? He told me this uh, amazing story, this amazing story that he had a major surgery that um, he was in Sky Ridge Hospital, you know, Sky Ridge over there, Highlands Ranch. And uh, he was on the eastern side of the building and he talked about the morning after his surgery when he kind of woke up that the sun was rising and was blazing into his window. And there was intensity of the sunrise that he had never noticed before. And he was sitting and he was taking in the rapture of the sunrise when he heard footsteps out in the hallway. And he recognized the footsteps, he recognized the stride as being that of his daughter. And his daughter came and, and turned and came into the room and, and looked into his face and, and she said, Dad, how are you? And he, and he said, I, I saw in her a radiance that paled the sunrise. I saw in her a radiance Hailed the sunrise. And I said to myself, when was the last time I looked at my daughter and saw that kind of radiance? You know, when, and when I left him, I thought to myself, man, he is a holy being. And the thing that, that inspires me is I ask myself, why does it take us dying to get to this point? Why do we have to wait to the end of our days before we realize what's really important and what's not important? Why does it take this long for us to come to this moment of enlightenment where we realize that we are not separate from God, but that God is with us, immediately with us? You know, uh, another one of Jesus' coens that I constantly wrestle with is the kingdom of heaven is within you. And I've been turning this one over for years, trying to understand what did the master mean? And I've been working on this today's sermon for a long time, getting this one ready. But it wasn't until Friday that I understood this. I was going down to see my in-laws in Salida. And do you know when you are going down 285 and you get to that point where you're dropping into Buny and all of a sudden you come around the corner and there are the collegiates. And it's like, whoa. And it dawned on me. The kingdom of heaven is within us. The moment of our conception when we were divine and God planted that divinity within us, it has never left us. The kingdom of heaven is within us. That power that created the cosmos, that flung the planets, that spun the galaxies is within us. And suddenly in that moment, I started laughing. I started pounding my steering wheel and laughing and hitting the dashboard. I said, I get it. I get it. Why is it taking me so long to get this? The kingdom of heaven is right now. You are a holy being.
You know, the greatest honor in all of our lives, I think there are two times. It's at the time when we sit with someone who is dying and the moment of our own death. As I'm sitting there and I watch the uh, three breaths, it's usually then that I start the mantra, today you will be with me in paradise. Two breaths. Today, you will be with me in paradise. One breath. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And that last breath, I always say, welcome home. question is, why do we wait so long to see paradise? Let us pray. Loving God, the life that we live is hmm, miraculous an amazing gift. Before we were conceived, before we were born, you held us and you planted within us a holy intention and we were holy beings and you sent us into the world not to, not to separate from you, but to always be connected with you. And if we have to confess anything today, oh God, it's that we have sometimes felt this separation. We have created this separation when it has never been. And your son, your son constantly was trying to wake us up. And so as we live and move and interact with other people, help us to be that which wakens them up to the paradise that lives within them, the kingdom of God that is within them. It's such a simple concept, but some people spend lifetimes trying to understand Everything that Jesus taught was simple. Like when he prayed. The disciples asked him, Jesus teaches how to pray, and they were expecting a lecture. And they, no, it was a it was a tweet. It was a prayer that was so simple that it changed the world. And so, God, as we say this prayer, we ask for it to change our lives, for we are asking heaven to come to earth, paradise to be in our midst. So open our hearts, O oh God, as we pray together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 